Welcome to Black Man Lab. We are live and we have a great topic tonight. Looking forward to the conversation. Um, we will be discussing um, Black men uh, protecting your mental health. Uh, we know that in these times that we are in, that uh, we definitely need to be thinking about our mental awareness of self and making sure that we are fit for these tough times. Um, with that, I want to get started with a little bit of our history. Um, and and before, actually, before I do that, I want to introduce my co-host this evening, my partner in crime, my main man, Brother Joe Barker. Joe. What's going on, good brother? Glad to be here tonight with you brothers, man. We have a, a powerful panel tonight, man. So I'm, I'm with you. We ready to jump into it. But yeah, let's go ahead and go through our tradition first, bro. Absolutely. Uh, one of the things um, that we like to make sure that we are communicating with our audience every week is where we come from. Black Man Lab comes from uh, four brothers, starting with um, Maldi Davis, who's one of the co-founders of uh, Black Man Lab getting together to have their sons have a different voice other than theirs, their fathers. We know as fathers, a lot of times, our sons are prone to not necessarily take in the information that we want to give. So uh, what the thought process was to reach to an uncle, uh, a godfather, a close friend um, that could serve as a voice for their, their sons. And that wound up growing into um, a really big and, and large congregation of young black men getting together, get information on a weekly basis. We would meet in person at the uh, Andrew Walter Young YMCA here in Atlanta and have over 250 people in the space to go over topics that were either about professional development or self-development. Tonight is one of those great nights that we're gonna be talking about some self-development. Uh, one of the things that we do every week is to make sure that we are in a place of taking in information, being in a place where we are centered on the, the conversation that is happening at hand. And first and foremost thing that we want to do is make sure that we are centered and, and ready to take in the information. Brother Barker, I'm going to bring you in to go ahead and get us centered, and uh, then we'll move to the next phase. Glad to, glad to. So one of the things that we uh, historically have done when we were in the Y is we, we, with so many brothers there, with, with everybody having such a, a diverse set of events that might have occurred over the past week or so, we would just always make sure we were in a brotherly and, and, and loving space with one another, centered and, and just hug and love up on one another, make sure everybody's good, everybody's solid before we would even start. Just make sure all that, you know, comes off your back, off your mind, so you can focus on, on what we're going to be talking about for the next hour, hour and a half. So in this space, what we want to do is we're just going to take some, some breathing techniques just to center ourselves. Some very simple, uh, Fred, brother Fred Parham normally uh, leads us in this and does a magnificent job. So I, I'll, I'll be his poor substitute tonight. But what I want to do, man, is just all of us that, that are out there watching this, man, and the brothers that are on the panel, if we could, let's just start with taking a, a deep breath. Take a deep breath in. Now let it out. Let it out. Now when you exhale, you're letting that, that, that tough Thanksgiving or family holiday that you had, the moments that didn't go well, the things you didn't expect, the things you found out that you didn't want to know about, all those things that, that we met with, the adversity that comes our way. Just breathe that out, man, and, and get ready for the positive energy that these brothers are going to be bringing to the room with this. So with, with one more deep breath, we want, we want to breathe in and get ready to prepare. So breathe it in and let it go and let it go. And with that, we let all that negativity off. We open ourselves to the conversation that's at hand. The positivity is coming in. And we look forward to these brothers and the wisdom and insight they are preparing to bring to us. Appreciate you. Thank you, Brother Joe. Um, the other thing that Joe touched on that we do is we, we offer up to anybody that's there in the space that if you are having a rough day, a rough week, a rough month, or dare I say it, a rough life. We are there to support you. We are there to show you just some Black Man Lab. We don't ask any questions. We say, come to the front if you can use some Black Man Lab love, and we wrap our arms around you. So 
What we want to do today is make sure that if you're listening in, know that we are here for you and that we are we see you and that we love you. So just want to put that out there and feel this hug from us virtually. Thank you. Um, the other piece that we do is we make sure that we have those that came before us, their spirit in the space, our ancestors. And with that, uh, what I want to do is bring my brother, Jared Grant, who is one of another one of the founding members of Black Man Lab on to uh, get us in the same space of the ancestors. Jared? Hey, thank you, brothers. Uh, welcome, brothers, and thank you for joining us today. Um, and we also want to put in our hearts and mind to think about our ancestors, those whose shoulders we stand on. Um, so think of, about some of the great ancestors of our past. Um, so think about a few of them um, in your mind. Put them in your hearts and mind right now for about three seconds. And then everybody raise your fist. And on three, say, Ashe. One, two, three, Ashe. Ashe. And now, brothers, as a group of healers, think about those ancestors that were great healers. You know, think about them right now. You know, who are some of those? Put them in our hearts and mind right now for about three seconds. And on three, say Ashe. One, two, three, Ashe. Ashe. Now, brothers, think about those ancestors in your own bloodline, those who actually created and made you. All of those ancestors that had to come together in order to bring you upon this earth. Think about your own family line right now. Put them in your hearts and minds. And on three, we'll say Ashe three times. One, two, three. Ashe. 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 Oh. Thank you, brothers. Thank you, brother Jared. Appreciate it, man. Every week when we do that, um, for me personally, it brings me into space and, and brings all of that that we have had on us into this space and one of relief. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, with that, Without further ado, let's get to moving. Let's get to talking about the subject at hand. First and foremost, what we want to do is give an introduction of um, each of you guys that are here as our panel. And um, I'll just kind of go around and you guys introduce yourself and tell, tell us what brings you into this space. Um, so Brother Wright, Brother Joseph Wright, I'm going to start with you. If you could just give some background on, on yourself and what brings you into this space today. Yes, sir. Um... So like you were saying, my name is Joseph Wright. Uh, I have been working in this space, I would say for the past, let's see, exactly seven years. I'm coming from a uh, social worker background. I'm currently pursuing my master's degree in social work at Clark Atlanta University. Um, so I have one more semester and I'll be mastered um, in social work with my specialization in health and mental health. I work in a, uh, I manage a family run mental and behavioral health agency in Union City, Georgia called Serenity Community Services, where we provide non-intensive outpatient services in our community. Um, my passion for mental health stems from that area. My mother always said that I had a social worker's heart and uh, just the more knowledge that I've gained about mental health and you know the impl implications that it has in our, com our community, especially in, you know, in comparison to other communities, I just feel like you know, uh, changing the narrative surrounding mental health in our in our community is something that we have to do. So that's kind of been my my been my you know one of my passions since then is just you know talking about mental health in in minority communities, but African American communities as much as possible. Awesome, thank you so much, brother. Appreciate that and appreciate you being here. Um, next up, my brother from Chi Town, Mark Christmas. Hello there, brother, brother Martin Monaghan. How you doing? I'm good, my man. Good. Well, uh, I'm grateful to be in this space and place, man, with these brother. And uh, thank you, uh, brother Jared, for welcoming the ancestors. because they did uh, just kind of send a, a warm vibration throughout my body. And so uh, thank you for that connection. I appreciate that. So uh, it's interesting because I've been in healthcare for over 20 years. And I would say maybe I stumbled into it because I went to work for a company called Procter and Gamble. Uh, and during my career there in sales, I ended up starting, they put me in healthcare at some point in time. 
Uh, and so that was both over the counter. I also was involved with some some uh, prescription drug launches. Then I went on to, 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 to stay in healthcare and do a number of kind of different assignments there. I worked for a company called Wyeth, uh, the over-the-counter consumer health care. So learning about the body, uh, some of the functions of the body, some of the, the, the functions of the mind were kind of part of what was happening for me through this corporate experience. And then uh, in the early 2000s, I took a trip to Sedona, Arizona. And uh, I was, man, really, uh, and I think we'll probably get to this. I was trying to figure, figure it out what was next for me. I was approaching 40. I was you know, uh, in a marriage, had been married for a long time. There's a lot of things that, that seemed to, that could be working different than they, than they were. And I just didn't know where to go. And I went to Sedona, Arizona, and it was during that trip that I got exposed to some other things outside of just the traditional way I was raised, which was down the church. Right. Uh, and when I grew up, you didn't talk, you know, you didn't talk about your problems or you talk about getting help or ask for mental health counseling. I mean, that wasn't even on the table, especially as a brother in the hood. They're like, man, you know, you get beat up having that conversation. And your mama be done beat you for having that conversation. So uh, that just wasn't a space. Uh, so definitely things about like healing. I heard the brother talk, say the word healing. Uh, but that's why I got exposed to being a healer. Right. And I started my shamanic journey. I started my journey with Reiki and reflexology. Uh, and some of the energy work that I do. And it's, it's, uh, and really what I found was that there's some other ways uh, that, that go along with what I had been raised with that support balancing mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, uh, learning some tips to really open my heart such that these things that I was holding, these emotions, these resentments, these regrets, these disappointments, these, all of these things, things that maybe should have happened and that happened and that should have never happened, holding them in, in a space such that the energy of, of, of life, the energy of love, this divine healing couldn't flow through me because of these blockages and getting some tools to support myself in doing that work and then now sharing that with others. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I say I don't think it was an accident because I don't believe in coincidences but it was divinely guided and uh, I didn't know I was looking forward until I got there you know and now being a Reiki master and particularly with the pandemic so many people are have so many challenges whether it be physical or mental or emotional combination being able to support them be virtually you know people are like man, right, we got to be in the same space when well, no you don't right uh, because if we wait to be in the same space and you that means you don't get to get better. And I just don't think it works that way. And I know it doesn't. So not only helping clients, but also working to teach people how they can do self-treatments and learn how. And we'll get to some of that stuff at the end when you ask me more about what my rituals are like. But yeah, I'm excited, man. It's, 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 I think it was divinely guided. Uh, and me being willing to say yes and get rid of uh, what, what mom and them going to think if I'm doing this. Right on. Well, I appreciate having you here, brother. We look forward to delving a little bit deeper into all of that that you just talked about. Thank you. Thank so you. Dr. Curtis Jasper, how are you, brother? I'm doing fantastic, Brother Marty. Thank you for having me. Glad to have you, man. So it's my turn, right? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, it's first an uh, uh, honor and a privilege <clears throat> so uh, to be amongst, amongst giants like yourself. So I, I don't take it lightly. Uh, uh, just to give you a back, a little bit of background of uh, of my journey and what brings me uh, into the space, is is actually a combination of uh, what I consider to be a lifelong journey. I am formally formally acknowledged as a counseling psychologist, as a uh, relationship expert, and as a master teacher. Uh, I like to refer to myself as just a teacher, right? Uh, uh, right out of undergrad, I actually started as a classroom teacher left as an administrator and my second career uh, became therapy, became counseling. And so I take a unique uh, uh, synergistic approach to healing where I use uh, a non-clinical, uncolonized therapeutic approach, uh, similar to what I did in the classroom as a classroom teacher uh, to service black men in particular, uh, but the black community as a whole. And so right now I run an organization that's entitled I Am International, and it encompasses a private practice. Uh, it encompasses a personal and professional development training aspect, and it encompasses a consultancy where I'm fortunate enough to line up with universities and nonprofit organizations to, to provide training on how to emotionally educate not just young people, but young people in old bodies. 
so my journey in therapy started uh, in high school. And so uh, Mark Christmas will tell you, like we, 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 we <laughs> and Marty growing up in Chicago, we didn't got it in. So my mother was ahead of her time and took me to see a therapist when I was a teenager. She worked at the University of Chicago, UIC, and uh, it was free as an employee. So she marched me in there uh, with some of the challenges I was experiencing coming up. Uh, so I had the experience of going to a therapist as a teenager. I went as a young professional somewhere around my mid-20s, coming out of college, having a son. And then I crashed at about 40, as you mentioned, uh, Mark. Uh, went through a tough divorce, lo lost both my parents. The real estate market crashed. And I found myself like I was done. And I was done for about five years. I came out of part of my healing journey is where I am now. Uh, so I finished a doctoral program and I walked into a white middle-aged therapist's office after seeing a bunch of therapists, of course. Uh, and he told me uh, to not come back. I'd always tell people the short version is I became a therapist in therapy because the white gentleman said, look, I'm going to just tell you, I'm about to retire. I've been seeing African-American men for years. Obviously, I can't reach them. If you really want to really get on your healing journey. Go back, finish school, and heal black men who look like you. And so, of course, brothers, I was pissed. I was like, dude, are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> the ex-wife done took it all, I'm homeless. I need you to shrink me. I need you to give me some tools and strategies before I hurt everybody in this joint. And he was like, no. He said, uh, you're not clinically depressed. He said, you pissed. He said, you're heartbroken. You're disappointed, mm -hmm. right? You're afraid but you ain't, ain't nothing clinical about it. And so uh, I left there and part of my pissed offness was jumping into finishing the program, uh, still continuously seeing the therapist. So I use a lot of lived experience in a lot of ways I'm still doing that. Um, so I take an educational approach. I do what's called, I, I how do I say this gentlemen? I uh, respectfully denounced traditional colonized, westernized mental health approach, right? Uh, meeting young people where they are in a uh, sort of a teaching, just give them the tools, teach them emotional literacy, give them the tools. Most of our young men in particular, they have been receiving instructions from adults from the beginning of the time. So we know that product works, right? The challenge that keeps that from happening is the non-significance. <laughs> right? So learning only takes place as a result of significance. So I uh, teach them strategies you know, and, and, and walk that journey with them um, as they go through oh, most of our gentlemen, most of our young people, they're not uh, experiencing mental health challenges, they're experiencing emotional wellness challenges. And that's different, and I know we're gonna get into that. So I'll pause there, gentlemen. Uh, that's what brought me into space. Actually, I'm still on my healing journey and I just want to live out loud and learn and teach, learn and teach as I go. So I'm grateful to be here. Man, it's a great story, and we can't wait to hear more of it. And uh, there's, there's some things you just touched on that I'm going to have to revisit as we as we talk forward. But um, thank you so much, brother. So glad that you are here. Lastly, and certainly not least, my brother, uh, one of the one of the uh, greatest that I know out there do the work, um, and, and a newly minted author, uh, Dr. Chris Bass. Uh, peace, bros. Peace, bros. Let me let me let me just say, uh, Dr. Kirk, man, bruh, <laughs> I'm sitting here, you know, like, whoa, this is some heavy stuff. This is some good stuff here. So, first of all, let me let me acknowledge you, brother, and your power. Uh, thank you, thank you for your power. Thank you for your story. You know, it it touches not just these boxes around here on this screen, but you know, that thing runs like a river, brother. I know that there's somebody out there who's going to be really blessed and touched by your story. And I, I can't wait to hear more of it. So um, let me let me again start off by saying thank you, you know, Brother Marty, for having me here. I'm always excited, Brother Joe. It's always exciting for me to, to come into the lab. Um, I remember the origins of the lab and how it was, you know, coming to be. And, you know, I, I'm always excited to share. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm Chris Bass. Uh, I have been doing this work here for about 24 years. So I'm on that other, a other edge of retirement. I'm trying to get on out of here. Um, 
from Washington, D.C., Northwest, I uh, grew up in the 80s, decided that I wanted to do something about my community that I saw change when crack came into the neighborhood. And crack didn't just come into the neighborhood, it just came into my family. So as it came into my family, I said, hold, hold on, what can I do to change it? You know, can I go and stop, you know, going around the corner to pick up the drugs from, you know, for, you know, my relative. And when that didn't work, I said, okay, well, there has to be something else. So I got introduced to the concept of psychology. And through my journey of psychology, I learned that in order to impact the, the body and behavior, you have to first touch the mind. But what happens when you don't know that the mind is trapped? So I spent a lot of time trying to understand how to untrap a mind. So I came to Clark Atlanta University, uh, uh, earned my bachelor's and then went up to Wisconsin. Now, Dr. Kurt, you talk about white, white theology. I went up to Wisconsin and it wasn't nothing brown about that. So I learned all of the ways in a psychology program, how to understand their way of doing it. But I did something a little different. I brought Naeem Akbar up to psychology up in Wisconsin. And folks were like, what is going on? Who, who is he? You know, I started to bring in ideas in clinical psych about Afrocentric psychology. So, you know, back then people really weren't vibing with the understanding of there being a different way of doing this traditional work. So for me, I did everything black. I decided to do my dissertation black. I, brought in the Nguzu Saba and made that part of my dissertation work. And, you know, all of these boys who were, you know, who had uh, been incarcerated or who had, you know, these diagnoses, I put them into a rite of passage program up in Wisconsin. And people in, in Madison, Wisconsin, and Milwaukee had never heard of this type of concept right, right there. So that sort of took me off. But Something changed for me after I left Wisconsin and I went back into Baltimore. My first stop went to Baltimore and then I went to Virginia to do clinical work and so forth. And something changed in me and I realized, and I gotta, I gotta you know, keep pointing to your box, Dr. Kurt. I gotta keep pointing to your box because I recognized that traditional therapy didn't work for our kids. So a colleague of mine uh, and I created this new form of therapy you know, back in sheesh, 1998, 99, called mode deactivation therapy. And mode deactivation therapy, hopefully you'll be able to understand a little bit of it as we go along. But the whole thing is not to treat in the traditional ways that we uh, treat. So that work took off. I wrote a couple of books. Brother Marty is not my first rodeo in the book tour. You know, I got a couple of books under my belt and yeah. we read, we, you know, wrote several articles, you know, on mode deactivation therapy, working specifically with African-American children and young adults. So left there and then uh, joined the police department here in Atlanta as the psychologist for the city. And that was, that was entertaining. And left that work and went to, uh, back to my alma mater because I noticed that there was a need to come back to Clark and for young, young people to see more of us. So I'm teaching, I'm doing some therapy work, I'm still writing, I'm still lecturing, I'm still doing quite a bit of things around the world. And I'm excited, man, I'm excited to be here. I'm looking at another corner and I see Molly there, I see Jaina there, my family, I'm excited to see y'all. It's Kari's birthday. So shout out to that young king, but I'm just, I'm just happy, man. Anytime we can get an opportunity to talk about mental health in a setting like this, man. Oh my gosh, how often do we get a chance to talk about mental health and as black men promoting it? Oh my God, my heart is already filled, man. I mean, if I had a cup, it'd be running over right now. So I'm excited about what's gonna transpire today. That's my spiel, because I, I will talk and talk and talk. Oh man, we love you it. Have, you're gonna you have, have a chance, <laughs> brother. And we are excited to have you as well as all the other panelists. Um, we know that this is going to be a strong conversation and a much needed conversation um, for us as black men, for sure. And uh, Brother Mowley, we see you. And uh, 
Jaina, my sister, what's Where's happening? Who's Kahari at? What's up? What's up? Hey, Kahari's Hi. right here. And my godson, Please Kahari, on. what's up, man? Happy birthday, brother. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. All right. You're 21. You. 21 today. You are dangerous. So you, uh -oh. you, listen, you need to listen in close <laughs> to this conversation. So, so Kahari, man, yeah. did, did mom and dad strategically make you hang out with them since you're 21 now? I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> uh, gonna go out, uh, dinner. Uh, all right, all right. Then you're going to the after party. All right, for sure, for sure, for sure. <laughs> Trust Wait a me. Did, go ahead, Molly. Joe, Joe, did you say the after party or the alpha party? <laughs> Well, hey, what did you say, hey. Joe? You know, we, got, we, got, we, got, we got a couple chapels on this week now, all right? So, all right. so Joe, all right, man, okay. Y'all yeah, yeah. represent every week. We here. Man. But, man, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm thankful for these brothers, man. Um, and and this, the mental health piece is, is very, very real. Um, the work that we do in both our civil rights practice, what we've done, uh, historically, when in the criminal defense space, um, and just living our lives as black men. So thank you, brothers, man, and and Marty and Joe. Thank y'all for what you all are doing, man, in terms of hosting this important conversation. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just lay back and listen up until we get to dinner, man. And um, and best believe I will be watching this tomorrow morning on YouTube. Yes, sir, man. Hey, I, 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 I want a hey, Joe. I I don't. Chris, you didn't say what your profession is. At least I didn't hear. Um, and what your your and what your degree is in? in oh, I'm a clinical. Degree. I'm a clinical psychologist. Okay. Uh, I'm also. I mean, we can go down the line. I mean, I'm a forensic psychologist, certified as well. So okay. I do work with. I work with uh, police departments. I work with uh, children. But my specialty and what I've really been focusing on lately and. Marty, you sort of hinted on the book, is I'm focusing in on survivors of sexual abuse because that's an untapped market for our young men and young women. There's a lot of talk about sexual abuse when it comes to European Americans, but when it comes to African Americans, that's a subject that we don't talk about. But it permeates throughout all of these interactions that we have, you know, not to be long-winded, Jared, but you know, we just had a holiday at Thanksgiving, quote unquote. And I was on DB's show, and one of the questions that he asked was, Derek Bozeman, one of the questions that he asked was, what happens when you have an uncle who shows up at Thanksgiving dinner who has right. octopus hands? You know, so we don't talk a lot about Uncle Charlie, or we don't talk about Uncle Ben who has touched, you know, the little girl or the little boy, and how that turns into a, a, a malaligned, misfunctioning, or dysfunctional adult which goes from generation to generation. So that's become sort of my new focus, working on that. And what, and my last thing, brothers, I know this is a little unorthodox. Chris, you, you talked about Naeem Akbar, but there's one other person that was also your mentor. I would love for you to tell the brotherhood who that was as well, oh. if you don't mind sharing. Oh, we're gonna, we gonna definitely get into my family lineage in a little bit, right. uh, but I, I, we'll save that. All right, all right. I tell you what, let's let's do this as we as we d dive into it because uh, Jared, brother Jared's just taking over, asking all the juicy stuff up front, man. We right. gotta say something for midway through, bro. And hey, you got my boy on here, so you I know. know, you know man, okay. Look, this is probably the first panel I've ever had where I know every single one of these brothers, man. So, you know, we gonna get into it, man. I do want to um, jump into it though. We brother, brother Joseph Wright, are you still with us? I know you got to jump off here soon, man. Are you still with us? Okay. Yes, sir. Trying to soak up some of this knowledge has been great so far. I'm sad that I got to make this other call, but it's a lot, man. It's a lot. But actually, the other call you're making, brother, every single one of these brothers on here will know just how important that is. But what I want to ask all the panelists, and I want to start with you, Joseph, is. In the environment, the, the call you're about to get on and, and where you and Dr. Kurt and I are every Saturday morning, how, how important is it in, in, in your life and the, the calling that you have? How important is it to mentor young brothers and explain to them the importance of mental health and wellness and the differences and the different 
things that we've talked about here. How how important do 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 you feel that is, and how are they receiving that in the environments that you're in with them? I think I don't think there's anything that's more important, honestly, um, than addressing mental health in our community, uh, especially nowadays. This is the first generation of children that are coming up with 100% access to the internet, so it's creating all different sorts of so it's creating a whole bunch of different types of distractions that kids, parents, families are not even prepared for. So I think that, um, I just think, I think it's very important. I think the kids receive it well. You know, I try, I try every time I speak over there at Next Level to talk about mental health, to watch the way we're pro programming our minds on the daily, to try to channel the things that we're using to, to condition our brains. Um, and I just, I just think it's, 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 it's very important in, um, like I was saying, when we're talking about the generations, I just, just think that this generation in particular is going to have, they already have one of the most intensive psychological warfares that they have to go through on a daily. Just when you wake up in the morning, the first thing you want to do is check your social media and or get on Instagram or get on Twitter. A lot of things that we don't talk about is how the people that created Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, they, uh, they all went through the same sort of courses that we're talking about to learn how to understand and control the human mind. They went through courses on persuasive technology to, to, to figure out how to capture people's attention and polarize their opinions. So it's, we're, we're fighting against a whole different level of, 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 I don't even know, just a whole different level of warfare nowadays with the psyche, with our minds. So like I said, I don't think there's anything that's more important than talking to and empowering our youth with strategies to deal with social media and deal with the different types of pressures that they're dealing with nowadays. Cause it's not even a, it's not even a lot of generations before this generation that can even understand what this generation is going to. And, 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 and you know, in regards to the type of pressures that they deal with on the daily and the type of people that is trying to make happy with those likes. And, so. and, and briefly, man, because I know you have to jump off and we're going to move on to the other panelists because I want to learn a lot more about what Brother Christmas is doing in his space as well. But Joseph, briefly, before you hop off, why, why don't you tell the panelists and tell, tell us, brothers and, and our, our audience, where, where is it that you're about to hop off and what are you about to be doing here? Yes, sir. So I'm, I'm hopping on to uh, Next Level Success Academy. Uh, you were saying a little bit earlier, that's a program that we uh, we started, me and a couple other brothers uh, from Next Level Boys Academy. And I'm sure y'all know them over here as well through uh, Black Men Lab. But we started a program just to basically install in our young men. Since we're the younger generation, we just wanted to kind of do a, a class just trying to instill in our young men, you know, the different sorts of principles that they'll need to be successful in that entrepreneurship or that business owning or or, uh, you know, just whatever goals that the kids have, we're just trying to instill in them specific strategies that'll help them achieve their goals. And just navigating manhood on a, on a level that, you know, just being black, being in America and just giving them, you know, different perspectives and different thoughts and just trying to connect with them on a different level. So we hold that call every Monday from um, 7.30 to 8, 8.15, 8.30, you know, it, whenever we need to get off basically. Salute, man. Salute. I, I, just, I just wanted them to see that, you know, young brothers like you committed to this space that are going into a space with brothers who know nothing about this, don't know some of the issues that they're even dealing with internally, you know, part of the diversion right. program or not. Just brothers trying to be fed and the space that you're giving them to do that. I, I wanted these, these wise elders, man, to just see young brothers like yourself doing, doing such good work, man. And, and we appreciate you, man. We appreciate you. Yes, sir. And what what, what uh, Dr. Kurt and Dr. Bess was talking about as far as uh, that emotional wellness and yeah, uh, just everything y'all was saying, that was huge. And I can't wait to come back and check out the YouTube so I can kind of hear y'all's y'all thoughts on everything that's going around in this field as, as it applies to our mental health. Because what you guys are saying, that was, you know, that I'm sitting here just trying to eat it all up as much as I can, like trying to figure out ways to knock it off. But that was, <laughs> that was huge. I appreciate y'all for letting me do this space for sure. Number love, Joseph. Number love, man. Christmas, I wanted to move on to you, and I, okay. I, I want to you kind of, man, um, unpack what it is specifically that you're doing. You mentioned a couple of things that I'm, I'm not that familiar with, but 
I, you know, I, I, I do my Buddhist chants and, um, you know, I, I've been meditating for three or four years now. Brother, brother Parm opened the doors that my wife and I have been a, a, a good part of that. But I wanted you to unpack a little bit of what you said, man, because our audience may not be as familiar and tell us about, you know, the impact that you're having, especially during this COVID experience where, you know, it's, it's more than ever that mental health and awareness and wellness is needed, man. Yeah. I uh, appreciate that. Thanks. Thanks, brother Joe. Um, so let's just step it back. 99% of any dis-ease or discomfort comes from some form of stress, whether it be physical, mental, emotional, environmental. Examples, I hit my head on the wall. I twisted my ankle. Physical, emotional. Uh, I've got a situation in this relationship. Uh, mental, the job, the pressures from the job. Environmental, I'm in a school where the, the paint, the walls are painted with lead, and I live in this apartment that has lead paint. So some form of stress causes what we call a dis-ease or discomfort in the body, right? And when it happens, it creates a block. And so if you kind of just take it back to a basic sense, if you bump your head on the wall, you get a lump on your head, that's because the body says, hey, we got to go protect that. We don't want to let nothing else get close to it. And so there's nothing that's flowing through it or to it to help it heal. So you go get that ice, it relieves that inflammation, it helps remove that block so that the blood can flow through it. And you're, you're, you otherwise you just imagine having that knot for 40 years or 45 years or for five years, you know. Um, but what happens in our body is these forms of stress happen, right? And there's nothing that we're doing to remove those blockages, right? And so the stuff just continues to build up. Now, have you ever seen a plant in, the, in, a, in a person's house? A plant can stand, it could be blocked by a wall or a window, and then it'll just bend to the side and grow to the side. You've seen that, right? Because the plant knows how to seek what it needs it can move around the blocks, but humans, we can't move around the blocks because they all, so we, we look to connect to something that's going to help us move those blocks. And so one of the practices that I, that I'm involved with is called Reiki and Reiki is just, look, they started calling this thing Reiki in 1932, like, you know, connecting to this supernatural, this sacred energy for help people to heal. But if you think about the laying of hands on people, you've heard these stories back to Jesus's time. You heard it before Jesus. So this is really ancient wisdom, ancient sacred traditions, connecting to this sacred, divine, all-knowing, all-powerful energy such that it can help you to uh, create a deep sense of relaxation, help you to heal emotionally, physically, mentally, and spiritually. So that's really what energy healing is about, right? It's, it's connecting to this energy such that it creates a space for you to relax. And when your body is in relaxed, deep relaxation, you can heal, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is, most of us don't even realize the stresses that we're carrying around or what the root cause is of the stress. And I love that the, the things that Dr. Kurt and, and, and other brother Bass was talking about, because um, I think it's really an interesting approach to unpacking. How do you figure out what I've been carrying around? Man, some of the stuff that happened, I don't even remember because I blocked it because it's so much. Right. Or some of the anger I had because my father left when I was two and I didn't even realize that I was 30 that I still had this resentment. Right. Or you like me, Curtis, man, I was in depression probably from before 40, didn't even realize it till I, till I literally almost lost my health. Right. And, and, and people don't say, hey, man, it's OK to go get help. It's OK to say I need help. It's OK to say I don't know. And so particularly with, I find with people of color, we have, I mean, what do you hear about this kind of stuff? From? If it wasn't for this panel, I wouldn't have ever heard of a, a non-colonized uh, approach to mental wellness, right? Like, that's the first time I ever heard it. I'm like, why the hell have I not heard that before? Right? You know what I'm saying? Oh, so so uh, I, I think it's, it's really that the time and the space is that uh, we kind of removed what we think we know or why we will or won't and really just explore something because we need something that works, right? And so for me, when I was going to therapy, when I was in my 30s and 40s, I didn't like the guy, I didn't connect. I went to psychotherapy, all this, and I was like, no, nah, this stuff don't work. But now I'm 50, I'm close to 50, I'm still having some problems. I'm like, I need to find somebody to talk to because this is going to end up bad, right? right? So that basically what Reiki is, connecting to this supernatural energy, such that people can find ways to 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 heal emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. I love it. I love it. Hey, thank you so much, man. A, a lot of my meditating and the practices I have tuned tuned into that, man. And like you said, some of the blockages 
Hell, Dr. Kirk done talked to me a couple times. So, some of these blockages, man, you know, you they so deep, bro. They so deep. So thank you for that, man. I appreciate yeah. that education, Christmas. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm going to jump in too, man. It, it, as we talk about this subject matter, right, um, one, I want to make sure that we're always connecting this back to our young folks so that they can have a level of comfort in doing all these different things that we're talking about um, in, in terms of um, checking in on their own mental health hmm. and, and being willing and open to have conversations about their own mental health. Um, because as we've touched on already, we know that that's a, a stigma that we have in our communities. Um, but these kind of conversations and seeing brothers like you guys being open and willing to have these conversations, um, I think for sure open the door. So I want to make sure that we continue that. With that, I want to go to um, Dr. Kurt. Um, Doc, so let's talk about what would you say what you would want for young people to know relates to that? Great question, Marty. I, I, what shows up for me is, I, and I stress this every time working with young people, is to really uh, become befriend their emotions, right? Um, as opposed to running away. I use this phrase called finish the feeling, right? And so young people, they often use this phrase called I feel some kind of way. And I'm like, exactly. I just need you to park there, All right? I need you to finish the feeling because they have feelings about feelings, which is better known as meta emotion. And so it's really a skill acquisition that's needed for these young people, right? There's not a young black boy that I know of that hasn't experienced guilt, shame, grief, blame, or anxiety, period. We can start there. That's all of us, no exceptions, right? And so to be able to understand that, right? What does that mean? How you can develop a recovery practice, even with young boys, young, young boys right? Uh, to teach them that healing is a practice, right? Doesn't mean that you are broken, it just means that you're wounded and we need to do some healing around that, right? And so oftentimes we work with young people. I work with young people who are going through an overload of emotional exhaustion because they are being raised by a person who is going through an overload of emotional exhaustion. So not only do they have their young stuff, <laughs> but they are trying to navigate the, the, the emotional baggage of the person that he, who's raising them, right? It, it's not a day go by where I don't get a call from a mother, a black mother saying, my son's broken, I need you to fix him. And I often retort, so here's what I'd like to share with you. Unless you are comfortable hearing about your parenting, <laughs> then I might not be the guy for you, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, to teach the, the, to make sure that the mother or and father, the family in general, is supported so that they can realize that the person who is exhibiting, the young person who's exhibiting the emotional out, outrage or outward expressions is what I said, oftentimes is the most courageous one, right? He or she is taking one for the team. He or she is saying, hey, it's a lot going on at the house and we may need some other agencies to get involved. And so uh, I'm going to forego my people pleasing and smothering and act out because I'm not sure how this works, right? And some of the things we, we, we need to teach them. A, what's emotional literacy? How do you become emotionally intelligent, right? What are feelings? Because keep in mind, as black folks, our default feeling is anger. <laughs> we skip over resentment, guilt, shame, jealousy, envy, anxiety, uh, disappointment. We skip over, we go, because we don't like feeling bad. Let's be clear, gentlemen. As a people, we don't like feeling bad. Young people don't like feeling bad. So oftentimes they're admonished for feeling bad. Suck it up, go to your room. I don't care, the teacher said this, do the dishes. All of that, right? So, so we as adults have to be become better at, at also becoming emotional literate, so that the young people can have a shot, right? To have a shot. A parent calls me, say, "Fix my young person." I said, "Great. This is going to be family counseling, <laughs> right? Everybody gonna walk away with some school, with some skill sets, right? And I'm gonna be your co-partner on this healing journey because no young person got here on their own. None. Man." That, that's so on point and, and what is needed to be heard. Um, I think the other piece that I'm, I, and I'll, I'll go to you, uh, Dr. Bass, on this, but the other piece that, that I want to touch on 
that I think is unique, and you guys are the professionals, so tell me if I'm wrong here, is unique to, uh, to us and our needs is that our level of history as a, as a people, um, where we come from and what we've been through resonates throughout um, the, the psychology of the parent, the parent's parent, and then it winds up down into these, these kids that um, we are not equipped to, to be able to navigate without some assistance at some point, whether that's a good friend who has a good way of um, navigating tough times or having a professional like yourselves. Um, that, that uh, what was the term you used before, Dr. Kurt, the, the uh, uncolonized, right? Uncolonized. Yeah, yeah. Marty and uh, Mark, I, I said, just so y'all know, I stole that from somebody, right? I just, it, 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 but it, I ain't it, make it, up none of this stuff, right? I bought well, I, it, I, I, I should you. say. I hear you. But, <laughs> but, I would have never admitted that. I love it. Good job. I, 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 I completely understand that, but it, it holds true regardless of whoever said it. It does, um, exactly. That, exactly. It holds true on a lot of the stuff <laughs> that we have to deal with in, in life in general is that we have to dissect for things to be an uncolonized approach because that approach is not made for us. Colonized approach is not made for us. It never was, never will be. So um, I digress though. Dr. Bass, your thoughts on that? First of all, uh, Dr. Kurt, I'm gonna always give you the credit for saying that. Every <laughs> time I go around and I speak, I'm gonna say, you know what? It was Dr. Kurt who gave me that. Yes, sir. So I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you that. I'm gonna give you that. Um, I. I, I when it comes when it comes to our people, you know, especially when it comes to our young men, um, it's been you know talked about a little bit. But what we really need to understand, first thing that I would tell people, my, my people, is that everybody processes things differently. You know, you process differently than your parents process things based on your exposures. So, if your parent went through a trauma, let's say your parent was hurt or abandoned. Now, what that parent will do is, in some ways, react to that abandonment and treat you in a way that they wish either they had, they may overcompensate, or something like that. So my point in saying that is that you're going to get something based on how your parent experienced their own trauma, all right? How you deal with that trauma may be totally different than how your parent dealt with the trauma. So now you have a whole bunch of young brothers and young sisters in a space, we call it school, and everybody is trying to understand their own trauma based on how they were parented, but then dealing with their own understanding of their parents' trauma that they weren't exposed to. But it's just a big, you know, 285 spaghetti junction. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what I would tell folks, number one, is to, again, to understand the trauma, understand what you went through, understand the feelings, but also give it a name. You have to label the name, you have to label the trauma, you have to label the grief, you have to label it in order for you to make plans around it. Understand that everybody will not like your plan. Everybody will not like your strategy for understanding yourself. Because when it comes down to it, that great philosopher, Cat Williams, once said, he said that how can I let somebody else be in charge of my own self-esteem? Self-esteem, is the esteem of yourself. Now, I have to say this real quick. When it comes to our people, Marty, Black children typically don't have problems with self-esteem. What we do have problems with is self-efficacy. Mm -hmm. So now there's a difference. So esteem is how you view yourself. Self-efficacy is the belief in that you know you can do something, you can accomplish something. When I was 17 years old, my mother introduced me to one of her great friends, Francis Cress Welsing. And, and from that moment, she started to bring her around the house and we started interacting with her around 17. So I got a familiarity with her. I later realized that she was my relative. So it was weird for me growing up in a home, dealing with my mom's abandonment issues, dealing with her understanding of self based on her relationship to that family. And then her treating me and my brother the way that we were raised. So now we were raised in a pro-Black home, but it was fractured. You got to understand that everybody that promotes a particular ideology isn't 100% on that ideology. They may not understand themselves the way that it should be. So I'm going to reel it all the way back. 
when it comes to our young people, there's a great book that I need everybody to go pick up. And I mean, everybody on the screen has probably uh, heard it and read it a million times. You have to go pick up the work of Joy DeGroy. Joy DeGroy came up with this concept called post-traumatic slave syndrome. And if we want to understand what's going on right now in some of the music that we listen to, some of the music that our young folks listen to, you're going to see some of that stuff. I got a shout out. You know, my aunt, Frances Cress Welsing as well, because there's a lot of work that she did, which really promoted a better or deeper understanding of the psyche behind some of the games that we play. Some of the, 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 the ideas that white America comes with when they sort of put things on us and how we put things on ourselves. But I would encourage everyone to be social science in mind, meaning do some introspection. If you're upset with yourselves, if you're upset with the world, if the only emotion that we are comfortable with is that anger, understand where did that come from? Because if you begin to understand the etiology or the origins of that anger, then you will understand how to treat it after you give it a name. Mm -hmm. Man, look, this conversation, uh, you know, we're supposed to end at 745. I'm gonna tell y'all right now, that's not gonna because this conversation is not only needed, it is empowering and it is insightful and it is refreshing. So I want to say right now, thank you all for all of this that you're doing um, and, and, and that you're sharing with us. Um, I had, to your point, uh, Dr. Bass, I had a conversation with some young folks one time and they were complaining about their lives and things that were going on. And I said, well, listen, what's the one thing that you know you can control? And so they all paused and they went through, they actually answered it in a way that wasn't the, the right answer. Um, and I said, ultimately is you. The only thing that we can control is ourselves. You know, and in being able to do that, you have to have some high level of introspection and be willing to, to call yourself to the target. So um, I, I, I totally am on board with what you had to say there. So thank you so much. Brother Parker. Yeah, one, one of the one of the I want to do a couple things, and you know, some of it's selfish, some of it is is selfless. One of the things I want to do first and foremost is just thank the audience, thank the audience for for being out there asking such good questions. Um, Niani Jewel that's out there asking asking great questions. Brandon Haney, um, just all of you all are, are really a part of what we do here. We appreciate it. One of the questions they ask, I wanna, I wanna go ahead and, and, and ask this, is a couple things. What happens, um, uh, Ms. Jewell says, what happens when you don't know your mind is trapped? What happens when you don't know your mind is trapped? And I wanna give each of you all an opportunity to, to answer that one. And, and then I got a, a couple more. And, and Marty, let me just say, I'm just telling you right now, with what I got on my mind, just me alone, 70, 40, 745 is shot. It's, it's shot, so it's not happening. But let's let's see if we can um, dig into that for for uh, Jewel right quick, fellas. Any order? Yeah, go ahead, Mark. Order, so, go ahead. Uh, so that's my wife. So I take the privilege with her. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, how do we don't know the mind is trapped? Is because I think a lot of reasons. So. Um, you know, I think back, I was in high school, I was a class president, right? And about 20 years later, uh, uh, I said, Mr. Mr. High School, you know, he committed suicide. Uh, he was like all American in every sport that there was. Whatever he played, he was best in the state. Fastest man in the state, you know, one of the best wide receivers, all of that. And we're like, well, how does, how does, how does this happen, right? Um, and it wasn't until then that I started telling people, I said, man, I remember being so insecure in high school uh, and I was willing to do anything just so that people would accept me and, and like me, right? Now, I'm 30 some years old at this point in time. I had never shared that this insecurity that I had with anyone. And, and folks would be like, what you mean you was insecure? You was the class president, you know? Like that can't be. And so what's, what became my awareness in my late 30s is that, man, everybody shows up with something just because they don't tell you that they got it don't mean that they don't have it, mm -hmm. right? 
And then I started looking for ways to not hold it all in because what I had learned to do was my mind was trapped because I compartmentalized. Like, I'm going to be like this when I'm with Marty and Joe and them. I'm going to be like this when I'm at the church. I'm going to be like this when I'm with my girlfriend. I'm going to be like this, right? And it all seemed to work until my mind all caved in on me around that 40 time. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And, and young folks, you don't actually have to wait till you have a breakdown, wait till family things don't work out, wait till relationships that you cherish go away to, to have something be different because you can actually talk about it. And, it's, and the, what you realize is that uh, you're not the only one that's going through it. Yeah, yeah. No, nah, it's that's some powerful stuff right there, man. I and be, be, before I move on, because some things you said in there, we we need to keep talking about. But I want to give Brother Bass and and Brother Jasper opportunity to to speak on that, and if you want to. Well, the the question was, how do you know when your mind is trapped? You know, fortunately for us as a people, we're not just one dimensional. You know, in fact, I would say that we're three or four dimensions. And within those dimensions, it's my belief that our ancestors live. So what we're going to do, as I've been trained and taught, is we're going to have these times where we have thoughts that come to us that tell us it don't feel right. You know, some people call it intuition. Some people call it that sixth sense. Some people, you know, reference the third eye and so forth. So we're going to have that feeling that tell us that it doesn't feel right. If you're doing something that's outside of your feel right zone, I'm not talking about how you were raised and all of the, you know, all of that stuff. I'm talking about inside. If it doesn't feel right inside you, then there's a good likelihood that you are trapped in some kind of way. Okay. That's just my, that's my belief. I believe that if you, mm. if you have that feeling and you begin to ignore it, then that's when the other things happen. If we can only operate based on what our mind tells us to do and our mind is confused and, and fighting and battling with itself, then our behavior is going to be just as conflictual. Mm. We're going to we're going to do things that look like us one day and look like us totally different another day. So people won't be able to read us because we'll be outside of what people expect us to be. So got to understand a consistent way of thinking. Anyone who knows personality theory understands that who you are at the core at four years old, you know, from a a, 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 a state point. It's who you're really going to push yourself to be, even when you're 80 years old. There's going to be some similarity of who you were at four years old when you're 80. So you better get that thing right. You know, I'm not saying that your thinking is going to be the same, but I'm saying if you are a good person, if you have something deep within yourself, like if you're extrovert, introvert, all of that stuff, you're going to be similar the older you go. So I like the energy piece that Brother Christmas is talking about, because that's another area that we really don't talk about when it comes to the mind. Mm -hmm. So I'm really, I'm really excited to hear more about this Reiki piece because what I'm learning is, is that these youngsters, they put all of their energy into the music and the media, but all of that energy, if you think about it, if you listen to it, those, those artists who really get the, the, the play, they have this, this frenetic energy. I mean, their energy level is through the roof. So they're tapping into something Right. that we're not talking about. So Brother Christmas, I'm, I'm excited to see how you're going to spill that thing out. I know you got it. I know you're going to break it down for us. But there's something there that's going to send the dopamine to our prefrontal cortex, and then it's going to hit the amygdala and talk about all types of energies and, and memories. And I'm going to leave it alone, but I'm just, I want you to set it up, bro. I want you to take us there. <laughs> Dr. Jasper. We're gonna get that. We're gonna get that, man. Don't, 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 man. We, this gonna be a, a, one, one of my one of my brothers done, done already texted me and said, "Hey, I think y'all are gonna finish at eight o'clock." I was like, "Yeah, it's probably gonna be pushing eight. He said, "No, eight Tuesday night." So, <laughs> let's, man. We may have to have a part two of this. Jasper, man, I want to I want to go go with you now. If you want to give um, just your thoughts on that question, man, how do you know when the mind is trapped, brother? So I think uh, the, the question for me, uh, which shows up as I hit a, as, as I hit a question is, uh, how long are we talking? Because it is my understanding that at some point, all of our minds get trapped. Mm. So it's not a question of how do you know when it's trapped, it's how long has it been trapped? Like how long you've been stuck? And as you know, 
Dr. Bass says, uh, Mr. Christmas, there's a lot of things that we could work on, right? And it's totality. And so one of the things that I remind young, young people is, is to uh, point out how they have been trained through the music, the media, and just living in today, how to purposefully hijack their own nervous systems, how to bypass their internal guidance systems, right? And to uh, condense that time frame of being in reactionary mode as opposed to just responding, right? And so they, when 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 you talk on this level, they say what? So then you got to speak to them on their terms where they really can get it. And oftentimes, that's using pop culture, as you said, Dr. Baz, or using some energy thing because they all can relate to energy, breath work, things like that. If they played any games or any sports, so when we talk about the mind being trapped, oftentimes. What appears to be trapped, meaning stays the same, is just the reoccurrence, right? Because we know that energy continues to move, right? So people wake up feeling a certain way and it's like, man, I've been stuck. My mind, my body has been stuck. Right? Oh, it changes. It, your consciousness is reset in your slumber. It's just that when you get back up, it turns back to the same thing. So in your mind, you don't notice that it is uh, changing. And then there's some things that you purposely do to have to take it back to that. And that is oftentimes uh, uncollapsing the different aspects of the person, right? For example, I talk with people, let's, let, me, let me drive it straight home, just in case uh, any of our young people are, are listening. The big thing is weed smoking, right? 98% of the young people who come to me have some connection to weed. Parents call like, what's up with the weed? My person is, my young person is smoking weed. And they I don't give them any feedback on the weed until after I sp speak with the child, young person, right? So I ask the young person, why do you, you know, what's up with the weed smoking, right? And they'll say, I ask them, why do they use it? When do they use it? How do they use it? All of that. 99% of them says, it just hope, helps me balance. It's some type of what they use as an anxiety uh, uh, modulator, right? To relieve stress or when they want to feel good or keep the anger, anything to help them feel better. And I asked them, I said, so, you know, which part of it? Is it the high? That's it? And they was like, well, and I was like, well, you know, that don't last long. You got to keep doing that. You got to keep purposely resetting the stuckness, which you'll pay for in your 30s and 40s. And then I asked the young people to consider this. I said, consider this. Take it on me. They've been smoking weed forever. So I, not that I'm a weed smoker, but I know a few things. Consider this. It's my theory that it's not the weed. It's the breath work that keeps you calm. They say, what do you mean, doc? I say, well, it's the inhale, exhale. So if you pass the blunt, you do that. You think it's the weed. You think it's the baby playing in the background. You think it's your homeboy. It's the breath work. What if I? What if you could use the breath work and bypass all of that? See, mm -hmm. you know, because it started off as a recreational drug long before it became medicinal, right? So, 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 so what if we could just bypass that where you had some other tools where you didn't have to rely on weed, right? In other words, get in the front of you feeling bad. You wake up, your mom says something, something happened on social media. You go right into intentional breath work, right? You go right into intentional breath work, right? They know that. Just breathe. Three seconds. Just breathe, right? It'll keep you present oxygen to the brain, as you mentioned, Dr. Bass, in one of your podcasts I was listening to, Reiki for you, uh, Mark Christmas going through the body, just circulate that. That is the calming effect, right? There ain't no, like, all y'all smoke weed. How are you going to be a leader if 99% of y'all smoking weed? So for one, you're a follower. For two, try an alternative. They like, really, doc? Why ain't nobody tell us that? All of them say, well, the adults could have told us that. <laughs> that was a I said, just I'm not here to tell you to stop or stop. I don't advocate smoking weed. I'm asking you to get in front of managing your emotions by doing breath work. And if you played any sports, you know the importance of breath work. That alone, the parent called back like, <laughs> what happened? Nothing. I just asked them to see it differently. Mm. See, if we get our children to take a shift in paradigm, they'll do the work. If you have significance with them, you give them a different way of seeing it, they will do the work. I pause there, gentlemen. So, 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 I hold on. I, in one, in one fell swoop, in one fell swoop, Doctor Jasper has revealed why Brother Parham and I have such good breathing techniques. I don't appreciate you calling me out like that. <laughs> I that. Right, my sons are listening to this, man. They didn't need to know that. They did not need to know that. <laughs> 
That's awesome, Doc. I hey, I, hey, I got to feed my family some way, Joe Barker. <laughs> Please, right. Hey, I hey, love I love breath work. I love that. <laughs> breath work. I love it. <laughs> so, so, so just to be, just be clear, Joe, so just to be clear, we are now referring to uh, herb smoking as breath work. Uh, Got it. Right. Cool. Just to be clear, Marty, we want to replace the herb smoking with regular breath work, right? I know. As, as I'm talking to the young folks, I have to, 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 to know they are doing that breath work already. We, you let the weed go. You're doing the breath work. Right, right, right. <laughs> well, before before we get into our uh, last bit, man, I, I two two other questions, and uh, one specifically for Brother Christmas, one for Brother Bass. Um, Brother Christmas, what, what I would like for you to just talk about is the, the crystal that you're wearing and just the different pieces. You know, what what is um, what does that represent? What kind of power does that represent? What 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 is that about? If you want to share that with us. And part two of that is is Brother Bass. I want you to not for the young brothers, the older brothers, for all these brothers. Your specialty is some of the sexual abuse that goes on. And some of us brothers, we, we're going to save these women. We're going to do this. Meanwhile, we brothers, and we don't understand. I, I, want, I want you to just kind of touch on that for just a couple minutes. Yeah. So y'all could handle those respective things. And I think Marty has some other things we, we get into as we get ready to shut down. Okay. All right. Uh Man, I'm I'm just so fired up, man. I I tell you this. Uh so so let me let me uh let me get to that, Chris, uh uh, uh Joe, and I want to just respond to Chris. So uh, you heard me say Reiki was something that they in, they put a title on in 1932. It was a it was a, a guy who worked in the seminary, and the way he got to it, right? He was teaching the seminary, his name was Yusui, and the teacher and the student was like, Hey, how did Jesus and them heal people? How did they heal people with the land of hands? So basically, he went up into the mountains and fasted and prayed for 21 days. To, and it came to him what Jesus and them was doing, right? Now, we're talking about 2,000 years before him. So Reiki is just some phrase that was coined by the Japanese because that was the guy that went up in the mountains and did it. Came back. He shared it with a person, opened up a clinic. Lady came over from Hawaii who needed to have some surgeries. Asked the doctor, hey, doc. Can I do anything before I had this surgery on you know, that final little checkup? And the doc says, my family went over to this clinic. They had some good results. She ended up going to the clinic, not having to have any more surgeries or have any things happen. She took it to Hawaii. She's credited with bringing it to, to the Western Hemisphere. They still call it Reiki. Two people later that she trained was one of the ones that trained me. So I'm kind of on four people removed from that history of it. But I'm clear that Reiki was something they just started calling 19. So he rediscovered it as Reiki. But what Jesus was doing, what, what they was doing before the end, before Jesus around, it's been called Prana and Chi and, and Holy Spirit and names that we don't even know because the colonizers done changed the names. Right. And so uh, let's just be clear. We're talking about this universal energy that has the power to do whatever. Healing is one of them, but the power to do whatever. So now to your point around this crystal, what is it? What is the power? What is this, these get ups, these these things they call chakras and whether you believe it's seven of them or 11 of them. Right. The thing is, is that. I use it, I describe it like this. If you look around your house right now, you probably got a refrigerator plugged in, a phone plugged in. You might have a, uh, a computer plugged in, right? Don't try to go put no meatloaf in your phone and actually keep it cold, though, right? That's just not going to work, right? Don't try to go to the refrigerator and watch ESPN. It's just not going to happen, right? And so they're all plugged into the same source of power, right? So energy is present everywhere. It's being able to recognize that. And then what me as, a, as an energy worker is, how do you help to heal yourself? But how do you, importantly, particularly in the work, that you, when you're around so much energy, you're around these boys that's setting it off, right? You're in the house and the people are doing these all kind of things to the kids and stuff. How do I protect myself internally and externally, right? And that's what the art of Reiki is really about. Learning not only to heal, but also how to protect yourself internally and externally, such that when you get a crystal, it don't matter what they say the name of it is and what the property of it is, because what I know, man, all of it is with somebody, somebody made it all up from the beginning. Amen. Right? And then somebody, they told somebody, and hopefully they pass it along. I mean, at some point, I mean, it used to be sacred. Remember this thing exactly like I told you. 
That's how the Quran was passed. Exactly, word for word. Don't change an A, an A, and an A, uh, or nothing. You know, that didn't take place in everything else. So by the time they got 2,000 years later, man, man, this, man, this, this thing right here, man, it'll make you fly. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, man, people made it up anyway. So it's all about intention. I love it. Right, so it starts with your intention. I believe invocation. Once you you invite the divine, whatever you choose to call the divine, to that space, to the ancestors, the pure love, to guide my intention, and then you trust that what you're gonna do is, is gonna turn out. And so these stones represent protection and healing, and and people that's in the energy kind of think it's cool to wear. But you know, at the end of the day, man, if I don't have this, then it, can I not? Can I not connect with you to like the whole thing that I do this distance healing with people via Zoom? They're like, first of all, I don't even believe that you can just lay your hands on me and I'm gonna get better. Then secondly, how are you gonna do that from a thousand miles away? And it's not until they experience it. Yeah. Probably much like what Dr. Jasper said, try just doing some breath work and just see what kind of high you get. Right. When I teach people how to do self-treatments at the end, I say, hey, put your hands over your ears. And they're like, what you mean? They put your hands over the ears and listen to the, and they can hear the energy roaring through their hands. And for me, that was like my breath work because I used to like to get out. But I did that, man. There was a euphoria that came over. I was like, and I could get this at any time. And the more I do it, the stronger it gets. And so it's just really about getting exposed to learn about other things. And you got to find what's your lane. You know, some people was this, some people was that, you know. So it's about, I don't judge whatever it is, but I had to find what my lane is. And, you know, I, I know that Jesus and them was doing it. And so Reiki ain't nothing against Jesus and them. I know the doctor sent the lady to the clinic. So they got nothing to do against medicine. So for me, it works for me. Well, whatever you plugged into, I got to plug into that. So I ain't can't nobody tell me that. I'm plugging into that, Mark. Hey, salute, man. I appreciate that, man. And, and we we honestly can clearly see your passion and your energy, man. And I, 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 I've heard you've been doing it for a long time. And just big, big props, man. Big props, man. Salute. Salute. Brother Bass, man, you, you have a little bit more of a difficult thing to answer, man, but these brothers out here trying to act like they're going to save this and that. I got four sons, man, and they, they each of these relationships were, were dead, man. You know, she went through this, but I think I can fix it. I think I was like, you broken. Shit. Uh, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, here's the thing. What you find with, with brothers and sisters who try to fix or save, you know, their partner, the problem isn't with the person that they're trying to save. The problem is with themselves. So what you're looking for is the, the concept of love. And, and you saw me smiling for the last couple of minutes with, with bro Christmas talking, man. I, I got to say something about your energy, man, because that's the energy that people experience when they're passionate about something, when they're in love with something. Even when you're in love with another person, you demonstrate your feelings through that type of energy. So you'll see brothers and sisters who are all in love and they're thinking about the person nonstop. You know, Beyonce back in the day had a song and I'm dating myself called Crazy in Love, right? Because according to science, that's the closest that we'll ever get to schizophrenia when we are in love with someone. It just takes our mind and we're just constantly thinking about them. We become delusional. We forget about their flaws. We are, we are just so into them. There's such so many chemicals going on you know, specifically dopamine. But there's something going on with us, right? And I have to caution my young brothers um, specifically because there's a lot of confusion when it comes to what is a man in this society, specifically what is a black man in this society. So you can go around and you can ask your friends and I want you, everybody who's listening, I need you to do this and I'm not gonna take it too long, bro, Joe. But I want you to ask your friend circle, are you a man? How many men do we have in here? And Brother Grant, you know, you remember we do this all the time with Dr. White. What is it to be a man? Are you a man? Are you a man? And everybody in that circle will raise their hand, yes, I'm a man. So then the next question is, okay, well, what constitutes being a man? Because of society standards, they probably will say something like, I take care of my family, I protect everybody, I da da da, what, you know, all of those traditional things. So then the next question behind that one is so, how would you describe your mom? Mm. And they would say, well, 
you know, my mom took care of the family. My mom raised us. My mom protected us. My mom. Did. So everything that you just said a man was, you just attributed to your own mother. So is your mother a man? And then they stop and they think and they're like, you know what? I have no idea what a man really is. So the first thing we've all talked about this concept of labeling, we need to understand what a man is. Then we need to understand what is it that we're attracted to in that other person? Because if a sister or a brother is hurt, what they're going to produce or what they're going to promote is a broken vessel. If we become attached or attracted to that broken vessel, then if that, if you somehow fix that person, then the thing that you were most attracted to at the beginning of the relationship is now over. So that relationship ends, right? If we're talking things that make sense. So my hope for all of the brothers and the sisters who are listening to me, very simple. Understand who you are first. Get yourself right first. If you're not right, if you're struggling with something, don't seek out to save or fix or even get into a relationship with anybody else because you're gonna do more damage to that person. Whether that person is perceived whole or fixed or good or bad or not, you're gonna still hurt them because you're not good. Now I'm throwing out a whole lot of old school music too. And I know my, my son's upstairs and he's introduced me to all of the, the artists that's really, really big today. And that's why I came and I chimed in Brother Christmas about the whole energy of, of the music and how people, these, these youngsters are really attracted to it. You could see a brother who's sitting and, and very, very quiet, right? But then they have in their earphones, you know, something that's really, really hyper. So they really are connecting to something that they really want to feel, but they don't feel the ability to express. Lauren Hill, in her miseducation of Lauren Hill, mm. she had a quote in here, and I'm, I know I'm dating myself, Marty. But what she said was, how you go on, how you go on when if you're not right within? Mm. How, you, how you going to win if you're not right within? So if we're talking about a relationship, wins and losses, wins and losses, if I want my partner to succeed and I want my partner to be good and I want to be good and I'm not right within, then I don't need to be in a relationship with this person. If I truly love her like I say that I do, if I truly love him like I say that I do, and I'm not right, I will let him or her go so that they can be okay outside of my own tragedy and trauma. Mm. Whoo, Marty, I, I have nothing <laughs> left, man. This is, Dr. Doc, Doc Bass got me. I'm, I might have to send him a cash app, so I don't know, man. I'm just, <laughs> these brothers, the way that Christmas, Jasper, Bass, and Wright have uh, just dropped so many amazing nuggets has been Man, we are we are in your debt, fellas. We're in your debt. It ain't over. It ain't over. I'm I'm done. You all have you all have fed us and nourished us so much, man. Like it's y'all just you, you don't know, man. This was so needed for so many of us. Brothers. But you know, Joe, man, it's, I know. I just want to. I know. I apologize for interrupting. But I think it's also important not to be missed the importance of 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 what your community is or what you call your community. I used the example of Jesus earlier, right? Jesus had a, a somebody knew money, somebody knew law. He had, you know, he had some thugs. He had some, some, some nerds. He had some people that had to get down with him, right? He had a, he had a community and it takes a real community. And what the brothers that I know that's on this have that same type of community. And so even if you get too far to, wherever you're going, they going, somebody's going to be like, Hey man, come on. Right. Or have you ever thought about this? Let me, why don't you go talk to my man, Kurt, he's a relationship expert, man. You know what I'm saying? Kurt been through the same stuff we've been through. And so, uh, finding ways to make it okay. Giving yourself like being vulnerable with yeah. your, with your tights, which with the, with the, with the one that you'll go out and, and, and do something with like them, the people, then you get them permission to be vulnerable. Right. And it might just save like we really like save a life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, man. And, and I think that that's, you know, one of the other overarching pieces of that is hang around people that you want to be like, right, that you want to emulate. You want you want to be, that'll give you a level of comfort that you are. And I know brothers on this this panel, you know, we have no problem. I had no problem talking to Joe and just opening up with whatever I have in front of me is going on in my life. And you have to have people around you like that 
Um, so, so that especially us, so that we can manage every day. Dr. Bass, you gonna say something? Go I, I gotta say one quick thing, bro. I gotta because you know, right now what I'm doing, I talked about the three or four dimensions. I'm hearing my grandmother talk in my head, right? And and what she's saying to me to tell you all, and it's, it's just coming to my memory, is she said this: "It's not what they call you, but it's what you answer to." Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Ho 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 ho. I don't think y'all heard me. <laughs> Loud and it's, it, it's, it's, it's not it's not what they call you but it's what you answer to. Mm -hmm. So we have to be careful of the words that we call each other. There's a whole lot of, even in 2020, uses of the word this and uses of the word that. But if we understand what that N word really meant, for example, and that's not the only word that we call each other, but if we just, and I know Joe, we can have a whole nother, you know, black man lab on just that word alone. But if you go back to 1987 and you look at Webster's dictionary, what it was was somebody who was ignorant, someone who was shiftless, someone who was lazy. And then something switched somewhere around in 1987, 1988, and it became a term of endearment. But my point is this, when you use words like this, it doesn't apply to everybody. So if it's a term of endearment, why didn't I call my mom that? Why wouldn't I call my, my girlfriend that? Because my girlfriend is not a term of my, she's not somebody who I, I love and I'm endeared to. Because women in our culture, in some cultures in America, don't even call themselves positive words. So if you're with somebody who refers to themselves as a bee, you know, not even a human, then there's a problem there. You know, what I've seen lately is that even young girls are calling each other bruh now. So there is this confusion. My point and the last thing that I say, brothers, I promise is I know we're approaching that hour. When you talk about mental health, you have to understand the words and the names and the labels that you constantly use because those words and those names and those labels are reinforcing certain ideologies that you you don't even know, you're not even aware of. So just be careful with what you call yourselves. Absolutely, absolutely. Look, um, I got one question from, from YouTube I want to ask really quick and hit, and then we got, we got to wrap up um, and get, get through our last pieces of this, man. We Again, we, we could be here until tomorrow, 8 o'clock. So I, I don't want to do that. I know y'all don't want to do that. Uh, we we got to be mindful of our families. So um, the question from YouTube was from Brother Shaka Baird. He asked, uh, what advice would you give a mental health professional seeking uh, to be more their authentic selves as providers. Um, and I think this is an important question because our health, our, our mental health providers need to be, you know, well fit to do the job, obviously. Um, and they, they can be under the same pressures that I'm sure you guys know um, as the rest of us. So um, get a therapist. Jump in. Yeah. Any of y'all want to jump in on that? Get a therapist. First and foremost. First and foremost. Gotcha. gotcha. Um, did, did you want to say something, Brother ba ja Jasper? I, I just want to make sure I heard the question, uh, Brother Marty. What, can you repeat it for me, please? So the question was, what advice would you give a mental health professional seeking to be more of their authentic selves as providers? Good, good. Uh, well, obviously, uh, you know, and it, the first step would be to, to get a therapist just uh, for the maintenance, the prevention, but for me, being a mental health provider, uh, there's more to being a practitioner. There's, there's a researcher, there's a practitioner, uh, there's a, uh, a, a healing, like that. We, we, and to first and foremost, remind ourselves as practitioners that all of us are in some form of recovery. All of us are in some form of recovery, like healing is a practice, like shooting a jump shot. And so if we act Actually remain in that space, we can show uh, a level of empathy and connection with our clients by realizing that not only are we doing the work, but we are the work and we're being the work, right? And so to recognize that we are not removed as practitioners from this whole idea of mental health, but that all of us are in a state of recovery from an emotional wellness. Brother Bass talked about it. Brother Christmas talked about it. And all of us go back to the first uh, time we learn how to relate, correct? And so there's a combination of things. 
I always start with the basics, breathing and, and language, right? Right, the consciousness. Uh, Brother Bass talked about uh, the words that we use and I take a strong, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, decolonized, non-colonized approach uh, to healing that doesn't require traditional uh, colonized mental health labels, right? You, we, I'll give you an example. In, in the mental health field, we use this strong word called mental illness, a phrase, right? Illness. When, even when we refer to mental disorders, right? So all of us experience some type of out of orderness in terms of our mentalities, right? That's disorder. Small percentage from research to suggest that they uh, are people with, with serious mental illnesses, right? But all of us go to a, a mental disorder component, right? So to be able to differentiate the distinction between disorder and illness is helpful as we serve our communities, right? Then there's this term called anxiety that we throw around in mental health, right? As opposed to anxiousness, right? We all anxious. <laughs> First day of school, job, day, anxious, right? Those moments where we're not present, we either in the past or too far, right? When it disrupts our life is when it becomes anxiety, right? Right? When it disrupts our life, when it becomes an anxiety disorder, correct? Grief. All of our young people are grieving. They experience loss on a greater level. They experience loss, secondary trauma through being on the internet, right? But for adults, we think that when the morning is over, that the grief has stopped, right? So mourning is the active part of acknowledging the loss, but these babies still grieving. So as, as parents, we miss that. Oh, well, you know, it's been three years, the funeral, you did this, and these babies are still going through grief. So there's a distinction between the mourning part and the grief part. And then my favorite phrase is the distinction between mental health and emotional wellness, right? Let's be clear, spirituality and philosophy came long before psychology came. <laughs> long before psychology came. Right. So spiritual, I'm going to say that again. Spirituality and philosophy came long before psych the field of psychology came into existence. So there was always emotionality in terms of how we show up. And you know, that's <laughs> that's from that's from uh, that's from us. <laughs> that's from African people. Right. Before it was hijacked by the Greeks. My fault. I'm going too far. Let me stop there. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. That's, that's what the black man lab is about. <laughs> Let me stop there. That's what the black man is, lab is about, man. We we do not shy away from who we are and where we come from right, and, right. and what our greatness is about. So never, never feel it. Like <laughs> I ain't want to take up all the time, Marty. I thought I'll park there for now, but that's what I... That's my long answer for for that question. Hopefully, we I, appreciate I you, stuff. man. And, and we we don't we typically do not curtail any of the replies that we get on here, especially as they relate to where we come from and who we are, man. So uh, thank you, um, Joe. You have one more question from from uh, YouTube. I do, man. We have um, again. I just want to thank all of our audience and our listeners tonight and all your great questions because um, I mean, like, I, we we joke about it, but seriously, guys. They're getting some free therapy right now. They're getting some free counseling that, man, y'all don't understand how many lives you're touching right now. Seriously. So we joking and we laughing, but brothers, man, thank, thank you so much. So I want to ask this one because because Charlie Ford has been has been asking this, and I, I really want to address him and thank you for, for asking this. How can you suggest direction to a young man who is feeling lost in which way to go in life? And you know, I'm, 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 I, as Marty gets ready to close it, I will ask each of you all to please, you know, give give a stab at that because every you all, every single one of you all, come from different perspectives, but have been powerful in every way. So in this capacity, I would ask each of y'all to just drop what you might think. Doctor Jasper, let, let's start with you this time. Okay, can you repeat that question for me? I think, one more time? I think. Thank you. I just want to make sure I got it right. Absolutely. How can you suggest direction to a young man who is feeling lost in which way to go in life? Great question. How can you suggest direction? Well, first, the first thing that comes to, to my mind is to first build the significance of a relationship with the young man, right? Uh, and, and take him under the wing so that he can see your lived experience, right? Because we can't give what we don't possess. Oftentimes we adult, we, you know, we babies in big bodies, but many of us are lost. We get up, go to work, pay mortgages, pay condos, we still lost. So we can't give what we don't have to young people, but we can show them because they 
watching every move anyway, right? And so they show, we could show them how to gain direction, right? And I know we was gonna close it based on the itinerary with some of our rituals and things uh, like that. But I often, and I work with, every single day I work with, with young men. And one of the things that I do is infuse tiny bits of my story so that I can say, I'm, I'm, I'm on it. I'm your cold journeyman, right? And, and often, and I tell the young people, it don't get easier. We just get better at managing. Oh, the world gonna punch you in the face, right? I'm here to, to, to give you a projection, to guide you, to hold your hand, right? And I also, I also have someone who holds my hand. I, I can't hold your hand without holding somebody else's hand. I'm able to hold your hand because I'm a hand holder, right? And so oftentimes we talk at these young men as opposed to speaking with them, sharing our stories, right? All of us learn by stories, whether you're in Bible school with a parable or sitting on your mama's lap or in pre-K sitting crisscross applesauce. All of us started learning by way of stories. So we do too much talking, right? But little baby and the baby and all of them, them rappers, they telling them stories, right? They telling those stories with those beats. I ain't asking you to bring in your drum machine, but I am asking you to insert your story so that they can gain some significance because then they'll take what they need from your story if you share it authentically and build their own road to recovery as your co-partner because they know they got you as their mentor. So any young people, and, and that's what I would say. I often tell, but I don't even roll with brothers who ain't connected to a young person. And I ain't talking about your child. I'm talking about somebody else's child, right? You want to roll with me. You want to go out with me. You got to tell how your person doing. Yeah. Right? That's the talk, right? I'll park that up. Appreciate that, brother. Well said. Chris, awesome. oh, go, yeah. ahead, go ahead, Bass. Only, only thing that I would say is, you know, to just come on the back end of what Dr. Jasper mentioned, to expose your story, but also surround them with other like-minded men. You know, one of the best places that you can take a, a young man is to a barbershop. That's where a lot of therapy goes on without all of these titles and all of these student loans. It, the, the, the barbershop, you know, that, that, that place. You're wrong right for there. that, Doc. You're wrong for that. You're so wrong for that. I had to tell the truth, bro. I had to tell the truth. wrong for that. But what you do at the barbershop is you get the brothers exposed to other men and the way that they interact with each other and the way that they talk to each other and the way that they feel and the way that they express and the ideology. So I always tell people something very simple, especially when I come around a young man about 18 to 21, which is typically the, the young men who I engage with. I say, always have two mentors and a passport. And most people say, well, what do you mean two mentors and a passport? I know we're in COVID, so this is going to shift a little bit. But in typical normal quote unquote times, I say two mentors and a passport because you need to bounce ideas, your ideas against other men's ideas and experiences. Now, of course, no man can tell you what to do and where to go in your life. That's number one. You have to figure that out for yourself. But to to push your ideas and to talk your ideas against two mentors and then go globally and talk to other people, see how other people live, you know, see yourself in different places because most people don't get outside of their neighborhoods. You know, coming from DC and I'll make this very, very quickly. I never went down to the monuments and the capitals and all of that White House and stuff. I, I never did that growing up in DC. And if you grew up in Atlanta, Maybe you didn't go down to CNN Center. You probably didn't go down to the zoos and all of that unless you were on a field trip. So getting out of your block, getting out of your neighborhood, getting out of your area, your space is so important. First place, get out of your mind, share it. Mm. Man, I, I can't tell y'all the amount of uh, jewels that we're getting tonight. Um, and, and, and the level of appreciation that we have for all y'all. Um, real quick, I had one person, um, another question on YouTube, uh, Brother Roger Barrow said, how important is it to have an African-centered therapist or will any therapist do? Um, answer that very quick, good. I, I know the answer to this, but I want you guys to say it. <laughs> Either one of you. Well, my general response is Anyone. it depends, but 
to be serious, uh, you got to find your person. Uh, there's a level of intimacy that re that 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 that's, uh, revolves around connection and vulnerability and holding space for someone. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that a white or anybody else could not uh, serve in that capacity. Uh, but I'd often look to start with someone who has same similar lived experiences. For example, for us and the thing is happening right now rage is a very familiar and comfortable emotion to experience whether we watch and tapes of george floyd or whatever right and so we need a space that's created for someone who can understand that as being a, a an emotion that you may be carrying as opposed to someone who may take your expressions of rage and try to apply that to a traditional mental health approach right and so those are nuances that can only come with someone who has lived uh, similar lived experiences uh, that you have. And that, that real significance, right? Learning and change and transformation takes place as a result of significance, right? And so without significance, I'm not gonna suggest it won't happen. Uh, eventually it will, but it'll take longer. What, do you wanna expedite the healing journey of someone in particular? Make sure that that significance is there. So as a therapist, you gotta find your person. And even as me as a therapist, it takes a bunch of people to go through. I, I work with five or six therapists now. You got to find your person. That includes a mentor as well, your person. I agree 100%. There's this idea floating around in psychology called cultural competence. And I think that that is similar to the idea of happiness. It's always going to be a pursuit of it. There's nothing that you can stick your, your flag in the sand and say, yes, I'm culturally competent because culture changes dramatically every time we blink our eyes. Now, what I will say is that anybody who is looking for this concept of finding an Afrocentric therapist, first thing you need to do is you need to pick up this article um, by Cross, and it's the Cross Model of Negrescence. I need you to go find the Cross Model of Negrescence because what it talks about in these stages is that even as African-Americans, we go through different stages of what it is to be Black in America mm. in our terms of our understanding. So where do I fit in on this model? Now, Helms um, and Parham sort of, you know, did something again in 82. But if you want to really understand what the levels of Black America are and how you fit in it, you need to first go start studying this, especially as it pertains to doing psychology. Um, as I end, because again, I'm, I'm, I'm respectful of time. I don't want to sort of belabor the point, but I got to say this, if you're out here looking for a therapist. As Dr. Jasper said so eloquently, you know, finding your person is so important because you're going to share so much of yourself if you're doing it right. You're going to share so much of yourself. You have to be vulnerable in order to, and feel safe in order to, you know, get the change that you're looking for. So just because somebody is your skin don't mean that they're your kin. You know, I've seen a lot of brothers and sisters who may look like me, who may not be an effective therapist with me. See what I mean? So as Dr. Jasper again, so said it, find your person is so important. Absolutely. Mark, did you have uh, some feedback on that? I think they already nailed it, man. I won't say the same thing. They hit it fine. <laughs> you got to, you know, just like any relationship, you got to find, you know, be with somebody who it, who it worked with. Otherwise it ain't going to work. <laughs> and while, while we got you, um, before we get ready to close out here, um, tell, tell us a little bit about your work at the NIAs. Yeah, so um, NIA, uh, N-I-Y-A-H, NIA means intent and purpose. Uh, and so it has, you know, we talked about the, the non-colonization. It has a lot of derivatives in, in, in African culture, uh, uh, but intent and purpose. And so really the NIA Center is all around educating, engaging, and empowering people to live with intent and in purpose, right? And, and we know that when when you when you're doing those things, that uh, not only does it benefit yourself and the individual, but at communities, organizations, workplaces, relationships, so forth. And so, uh, all of our programming is designed around that. Uh, and so, 
uh, it's really a social enterprise, right? It's, it's, an, it's an organization, my wife and I, uh, my wife is in divinity school right now. She's finishing in May her master's in divinity. She'll be getting her PhD. She's gonna go on to get through. She just sent her application in the day. Uh, cheers to her, finished her PhD application today, uh, studying interreligious engagement. But what we realize is that, you know, just much like we're talking about today, um, this whole concept of African traditions has been lost over time, whether it was colonized and changed or stolen or whatever. You know, even the word religions, for example, that's a word that colonists made up. It didn't, there was no thing as religions before, right? And now we call it religions. And if you say something about tradition, they're like, well, why do you say traditions? Because it was a tradition before it was a religion. But the, 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 the reality is that we've gotten so far away. And so what we're looking to do is say, hey, you get to have a voice, you get to have a space to express, you get to have a space to learn without uh, being converted, feeling like you're going to be converted or convinced to come on over to where I am, or uh, I got to come on over to where you are. But it's a safe space to, to get that information. That's what Sacred Space Sunday is. All Verse Thursdays is where I bring dope artists together and to share their verse, whether they be uh, authors or, or or poets or producers or, or filmmakers, right? They're telling a story. Go back to this sacred tradition of being the storyteller, right? That passed along. And in that story, they talk about their purpose, their journey with purpose. Like much tonight, we talked about our journey with healing. Like, man, it's important. We've been sweeping it under the rug and it just didn't work for, for decades. It didn't work for me. For, for generations, it hasn't worked for us as a people. So what we're saying is young people don't sweep it under the rug, expose that thing, you know? The, the, there's a there's a, a text that says knock and knock and they, you know they'll answer right seek and you'll find right ask and you shall be it'll be given to you and but the, what what it's saying is that you've got to get an intimate knowledge with a thing in order to know this thing so if you want to get some healing you got to get an intimate knowledge with healing it's like I know Marty I've been with Marty when we was in good times and bad times and highs and lows and broke and and, and not broke so I got an intimate knowledge of who Marty Marty is and such that it ain't it don't just show up that I only know a, a rich Marty or I only know a, a, a funny Marty. I mean, I, I, I know a Marty who's a brother that has all aspects. And so such is it with your healing and whether you're looking for you finding a therapist, you're in a relationship, being willing to be an intimate knowledge with it. And that's what I do with, with my practice in the NIA centers to give you an opportunity to have an intimate knowledge, meaning to know for yourself. Not because someone else told you this is what you should be doing, right? And also giving other space and grace to know for themselves, not because you told them that's what they should be doing. Thank you, brother. Thank you for that. Um, listen, man, we are we're way over. Um, but what I want to do, we I, I can't leave this session without us doing our, our, our traditional uh, last question, which is. What are your habits, rituals, and disciplines that you guys do personally on a daily basis to keep you moving, to keep you centered, um, to keep you in doing this work that you're doing? Because quite honestly, the work that you guys, you, the three of you all, the work that you all are doing is, is so important for our community. And I know that there are times that if you don't have yourself in a good centered space, that, that it would crush you taking on other people's issues. So uh, what do you do um, that are your habits, rituals, and disciplines that you do on a daily basis? So Doc Bass, I'm going to start with you, man. You've done this before, so I, I know that you'll, you'll be ready. Uh, for me, Brother Marty, it's about finding a good therapist. That's number one. Number two, getting out in nature. It's I take a walk, a three-mile walk every morning, you know, and it's good. Drinking much water, meditating as often as possible. You know, you don't recognize the power of meditation until you actually become good at it when it becomes your religion, you know? So meditation, getting those, those energy pieces up, Brother Christmas, is so important. Um, tuning out and tuning off. I mean, turning off everything, you know, that's part of my ritual. There's parts of my day where my phone is turned off. You know, my computer is turned off. You have to disconnect. So I do that. And of course, spending time with brothers like yourselves, it's always refreshing. This particular um, thing here tonight, this, this took my energy levels way, way up. So we need to do more of these check-ins and those things help me. And to your point, uh, Doc, we, 
we need to continue this particular type of session. Um, we've said that as we've been doing these different topics week to week, that um, some of them are, are just like this, where we feel a certain level of refreshing in our inner soul that we know if people are listening and we know that people that have listened that have got back to us and said, man, what you all did on that particular day, need to do it again. Um, we know that we need to revisit this and then I'm gonna, yes. um, before I continue, ask all the three of you all that when we do come back to this, this kind of topic, that, um, you, will, you will be on our uh, panel again. So um, with that, Dr. Dr. Uh, Dashwood, what about you? Habits, rituals, and disciplines. Thank you, Marty. So on a daily, uh, you know, I start, uh, before I get out of the bed, I start with my breath work. I usually take anywhere from three to five, 10 deep breaths, all right, just to kind of center me long before I lift my head out, out of, off the pillow. Um, then I make my bed to, to bring my slumber to complete, to set the intentions of my day, to, 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 to remind myself that my day has started. There's usually a glass of water on a nightstand. I hydrate, hit the bathroom, brush the teeth, and go through my meditation and prayer and journaling and read, all right? Um, and so all of this takes about two hours. Um, I, I, I haven't even come close to touching my phone within those two hours. My phone is unplugged on in my home office or firing up my laptop, right? And so I learned year, many years ago um, to be at the intent of my day, to be at the cause and not the effect. I had to check on me before I let the world end via cell phone or, or, or laptop. Uh, and I usually open up the back patio do doors and take more deep breaths, get out in nature. Uh, and then I get my day started, right? Then I get my day started. So about two hours, I'm kind of just checking in with myself, making sure I release some stuff from the previous days a week, making sure I have a level playing field to be of service, to be good to myself. And the way that I teach checking in is give yourself about two hours, check in, how am I feeling? 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 Label it. I use what's called a ruler effect. I recognize feelings and emotions, and then I get to understand them, I label them, I express them, and then I regulate them, right? And so those are just the things that I do on a daily basis. So whenever I have an appointment, I'm up two hours early. And it's often just two hours, because I got it. I cannot give you guys or the world what I don't already possess. And then on a greater scale, after you know, I get my uh, agenda started, I look to become uh, consistently a part of two at least two organizations like this with men who look like me who can hold me accountable. It's hard to act a fool in your personal life if you got to show up with brothers like y'all on a regular basis, right? <laughs> it's hard to be a clown though. So everything's fair. You get to show up and be your best self as a result of being good to yourself through your own personal recovery program. And so I kind of live by that. And it makes it very easy to teach other person, people when you live in your authentic self. Yeah. Man, thank you, brother. And you dropped a lot of little jewels in there, too. Got to remember that ruler effect. I like that. I like that. Thank you. Uh, brother Mark Christmas. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, this. so it starts off when I wake up, I'm, I, I hit a gratitude prayer. I hit a prayer. You know, I'm grateful. I will not worry. I will not be angry. I'll be kind to every living thing. I will do my best. You know, something around those five principles, gratitude, joy, trust, but being my best and being kindness, right? Some kind of prayer, uh, maybe with the Lord's prayer. I'd spend some time with some divine download, right? So for me, I do a self-treatment. I teach folks how to do self-treatments. Uh, but sometimes it's it's uh, it's it's really what Brother Jasper said. It's, it's breathing, right? It's really allowing myself time to... to um, um, to, we're coming back to consciousness, right? So, so coming back to this consciousness and being conscious of what am I starting to fill it with before I go out? And so for me, that's some kind of spiritual piece. It's whether it's a devotion or something I read. Uh, and I believe that there's also need to take time for some divine download. So in my, in my prayer, I'm asking for guide me for this day. Right. And so whether that I pick up a journal and write down, what is it that you would have me to, to know for the day? What is it that you would have me to, to have the day look like? Because this divine, while I'm connected in this divine consciousness, uh, and then I go about my day, man. And uh, so that's generally how my day starts. And then I end it very similarly with a prayer, 
that you know, those five principles. I'm grateful, you know, um, I'm joyful, I'm loving, <laughs> I'm doing my best, I'm kind to every living thing. Uh, and sometimes I'll say the Lord's Prayer at the end of that night and maybe do a quick self treatment. My man, thank you so much again, uh, Mark. Appreciate that. Appreciate all of you all's insight and uh, wisdom. Uh, and all the nuggets that you dropped. Brother Barker, is, you, is there anything that you wanted to bring in to cl uh, close out before I, I finish this off? Yeah, I, I just want to close it out with, again, thank you for you brothers. And each one of you said something that um, I just wanted to echo with um, Charlie Ford asked a question earlier about a young brother not knowing direction, not, not knowing what direction and so forth. And only two cents I want to say is a couple of things that all of y'all have touched on. First and foremost, none of us know direction. We're all still figuring out on a daily basis. I graduated as an engineer and changed careers 30 years later into education, which has become the love of my life. I would not trade anything in the world for half the salary, but impacting so many students. I wouldn't change anything. So give them the space. But like each of you said, one thing I'll say that, that has impacted me, and I'll, I'll say it started with Let Us Make Man and uh, Next Level Boys Academy. Putting myself in a space, even in the proximity of brothers like Let Us Make Man and Next Level, the, the Derek Bozers, the Bass, the Whites, the Molly Davis, the, the Gary Davis, the Dupree's, putting myself in space like that, when you start talking about nothing up and you brothers have to look at me nah nah that's not happening i have a bigger calling to answer to there's no way that i'm going to be that far out because you brothers will yank me back you'll yank me back with love you'll yank me back with education like you have to make sure you're surrounded by good solid brothers that will do that and do that with love and integrity and i, I would just say for ford man just there's so many great spaces like this and, and so many people that are mentoring in these spaces. I know each of you all have practices, you mentor, you're in spaces with these brothers. So I just, I thank you for what you're doing. I, I want everybody to know that you're in these spaces. So if they need to reach out to you personally, they, they should and they can. And we'll make sure we communicate that information as well. But for, for everybody out there listening, you know, you guys have said everything that needs to be said and could probably talk another two days, but thank you very much. I appreciate you, brothers. Thanks again, Joe. And, and um, I echo everything you said. I, I could go on and on myself, but um, we are way over time, obviously. Uh, so every week, man, we, we go through this process of Black Man Lab. And one of the things that we do, um, when we are in, in person together, we do a traditional um, uh, of a ritual that we do every week. Uh, it started with uh... man. Did, did 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 he freeze or did did I freeze? He froze. <laughs> okay. Well, you know that's that's just a time limit saying y'all done gone way too far. <laughs> <laughs> hey, time is just Exciting a source of measurement, man. Don't give it no more the credit than that. <laughs> Marty, are you with us? Are you back with us, brother? Yeah, yeah, he's back. Marty, you, you froze on us. You froze on us. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Get back, brother. Close can everybody up. hear me? Okay, cool. Every week, <laughs> we do a, a link, what's called a, I'm a link in the chat. So we will be in person together, link arms together. Froze again. Joe, close it out. Or Jared, close it out. Jared, close us out, brother. All right, brothers, we, we, we do this ritual um, in honor of one of the queens from our community who started this tradition. Um, and so we, we all say, um, I'm a link in this chain. I'm a link in this I'm chain. A link in this chain. And, it and it won't break here. And it won't break, it won't break here. here. I am a link in this chain. I, I am, am a link, link in this chain. chain. And it won't break here. And it won't and break, it break here. here. We are links in this chain. We are links in this chain. this chain. And it won't break here. And, and it, it won't break, break here. here. I say, brothers. I say, brothers. Thank, you, Thank you all. Thank Appreciate you. Thank you, bros. Uh, we will do this right. again soon. Thank you, everybody, for listening in. Love you.
Love you all. Peace. Love you, brother.